So to you know, a smaller audience is good. You can always talk me and you can uh, sort of delve into other things that you might find more interesting than just what I'm uh, talking about over here. So um, in the four of you, I, I know two of you. Okay. So uh, and for the other two, I'm Satish, and I uh, primarily teach sort of the computer engineering courses uh, over at ECE. Are you on the electrical option by any chance? Yeah. You are? Okay. And I'm not seeing you yet. Are you in third year right now? Fourth year. Fourth year. So, so yeah. you missed taking the class with me. 320, 320 with me. 320. ECE 330. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Anyway, so uh, what I thought I'd do today was uh, we can structure it in a couple of ways. One is I can just give you uh, a bit about what uh, is an emerging sort of research theme called psychophysical systems. And um, in that sense, it encompasses some of the research that I do. And I think this is uh, particularly interesting because uh, uh, for people with your background where uh, there's a stronger sort of physics influence and that might be uh, of interest to uh, what you want to do later. So uh, let me start, I mean, because uh, part of this was, you know, I think, I, most of the work that I do, I think, is more trivial. And so we should always take uh, trivia as being something that's important. So I thought, uh, I'd start my talk by saying, uh, asking you which book would begin with these lines, right? Outside the tent, the hyena made the same strange noise that had awakened her, but she did not hear him for the breathing of her heart. And the picture is supposed to be a clue if that's going to be any talk. This is just to say, you know, you ought to be reading more than just textbooks and, uh, and, and notes, right? Uh, this is a book that I strongly recommend most of you read. It's The uh, Snows of Kilimanjaro by Ernest Hemingway, and that's uh, Ernest Hemingway, uh, since he did quite a bit of military service. So, a young Ernest Hemingway, and this is uh, Snows of Kilimanjaro. I, I, in the past, I used to ask these sorts of questions in my midterm exams for extra credit. And uh, some people thought it was nice. Uh, some people thought that I shouldn't give extra credit for stuff that I'm not teaching. But you should, you know, marks are just marks. Here's another one, maybe a bit easier. Uh, this is uh, the interesting connection between uh, Bunsen and Kirchhoff uh, resulted in the discovery of an element. Okay. And it also has the unique claim to being the first element that was discovered by spectral analysis. Which element? Sodium? Not sodium. Sodium we knew uh, way before, right? Uh, uh, and we, we could do sort of chemical analysis with sodium. So there's sort of maybe a way to uh, depend on how many of you plan to take the GRE and uh, go to grad school. Uh, the answer to this is uh, cesium. Cesium turns out to be the first element that was discovered by spectral analysis, and cesium is derived from Latin for sky blue, right? So the sort of hint is that you had these blue lines, and uh, um, so cesium is from Latin for sky blue, which will uh, I'll use that as a segue to talk about some of the research that I did for my PhD, which has influenced uh, some of the other work that I do uh, in interesting ways. And this is also sort of blue sky work uh, because it deals with radar systems. And so one of the things that I spend a lot of my time doing is dealing with scheduling problems, and uh, in particular scheduling problems that have timing constraints. So you want to get a bunch of tasks done, and these tasks have deadlines associated with them, and you'd like to know, given a set of tasks, can I uh, feasibly meet the deadlines of all these tasks? And uh, this is a problem that's had you know, extensive work. Uh, scheduling problems have been studied for about 60, 70 years. Uh, but the specific context of looking at this problem is for radar systems, which, as it turns out, are really hard to schedule. So you want to schedule a radar. Right? So the task here is to schedule what's happening on the radar. And what is actually happening on the radar is that the radar sort of sends out uh, a beam. Uh, hopefully, it hits some uh, target in the air, and you get a reflection. And then you'd have to uh, predict the movement of that aircraft, and then you try to track it again sometime in the future. And this problem becomes quite interesting. So if you want to track an aircraft, you'd have to repeatedly uh, 
position the radar so that you can track it. And the positioning itself these days is not hard. You have phased array radars which have electronic beam steering. And so it's not like the old radars which actually have to physically move to track the object. But you have to go and revisit uh, all your tracks or targets uh, somewhat periodically. And the question is how many, how many targets can I feasibly track? Okay? This is sort of important uh, in many systems, in aircraft traffic, uh, traffic control, uh, aircraft traffic control, and in, in naval systems, and uh, even other aircraft. And the challenge here is that the kinds of constraints of these radars are enormous. Uh, you have to send out your radar beam that's uh, over the top right the corner, right? And you have some segments where the uh, antenna is sending out the beam, and you cannot do anything else at that time. And then there's a pause period when you're waiting for the echo, and then there's a period of time when you're actually receiving the signal. Okay. Now, you have to predict, based on your earlier estimates, what the distance is between sending out the beam and receiving the echo, and so you sort of predict an idle period. And if you're thinking, oh, I want to schedule lots of tasks, the, the general idea is, oh, you know, if there's some idle period, let me do something else in between such that I can come back and receive the echo. So here, uh, bottom right, I show you how uh, two tasks can be interleaved. So I can schedule the blue task, and set out a beam, and then schedule the green task, set out a beam, and maybe this target is closer by, so I receive the echo even before I receive the echo from the blue target. In the other case, the interleaving is slightly different, so I have two sends followed by two receives, except here the receives are, inter uh, are interchanged, so you get a blue receive and then the so the problem here is, I want to schedule, I want to meet deadlines. There is this problem of having to pack these wells, as they are called radar wells. That's one constraint. Uh, and when I'm sending out a beam, I cannot do anything else. I can't send out two beams at the same time. Another constraint happens to be energy constraints. This is uh, quite interesting because the radar heats up every time you send out a beam. And if your radar overheats, then these uh, panels are going to burn. And which means over time you go, you're going to have degraded service. So you have to also schedule tasks, keeping in mind the fact that uh, you don't want the threshold temperature, you don't want the operating temperature of the radar to cross the threshold. Now this problem was not really significant for uh, many years because radars were large uh, and heat dissipated fairly quickly. But over time, we've sort of shrunk the size of the radar, so the problem of heat dissipation is quite significant. In just the same way that we shrunk our processes and heat dissipation is a problem, um, radars have become smaller and heat dissipation is a problem. So you have to keep this threshold constraint, uh, you have a complex set of interleavings to deal with, and you want to ensure that you schedule as many tasks as possible. So the question is, um, what, you know, how can I do the scheduling? And it turns out that was not the interesting part. We can do the scheduling uh, using some sort of search-based algorithm. And given a set of tasks, you could construct uh, a schedule. And how did we define what a task was? We said, OK, I know everything about the task. I know, for example, how long I need to transmit. Well, OK, let's see. OK. Do you want some too? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll worry about that. All right. Yeah. Well, everybody's just going. Yeah. These are the front. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a box. Yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, we just we do we do that. You want one? Not quite enough. All right now. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess you can do that. Yeah. Exactly. It's a little hard to talk when you're stepping in. Well, yeah. Well, definitely. Yeah. Come up with a way of scheduling them. But in reality, 
we want to be able to select those parameters. How long should I send out the beam? Uh, how much energy per beam, uh, etc. And that improves the quality of tracking. So now, they said, the question really is, how can I pick the parameters such that you can then generate a schedule? Okay? So the problem is not so much about just finding the schedule. It is a feasibility question. Okay? So if I want to pick some parameters, I need to know, are my choice of parameters actually feasible in the sense of my being able to generate a schedule? And this is the problem that uh, in, the, in my area of work, which is sort of real-time systems, people have tackled uh, for about three decades. And, but not in such a constrained setting. There are very difficult constraints over here. One which is that you have to do this well packing and you have this energy constraint and so on. So we spent a lot of time, um, uh, or rather I spent a, a lot of really hours thinking that I would never finish my PhD uh, because this was a problem that I started working with and uh, there was nothing interesting coming out of it. So we had the scheduler and we thought it was great, and many other people thought the scheduler was great, but they wanted to know if we could uh, do this optimization. So in reality, what is it that we're doing? If you have a set of tasks, uh, you're really allocating resources. Okay? So I'm just saying, you know, let's just increase the resources uh, along the x-axis. So the more resources I allocate to a particular task, the more my utility is. So the better the quality of tracking, for example. So if I have two tasks, I can allocate more resources to each task, thereby improving the quality of tracking. But really, I have a finite amount of resources. Uh, in most cases, we might say, well, I cannot use more than 100% of my available resources. But when you have these sort of nasty scheduling problems, it turns out you cannot operate at 100% efficiency. Uh, you cannot utilize, for example, your radar 100% of the time and satisfy all these constraints. It's just what impossible. So you want to maximize the sort of global utility, uh, which might be a weighted sum of errors, etc., uh, subject to saying, you know, how much of the resource can I use? Uh, a standard uh, sort of result that exists is for some kind of tasks, there's a result that says you should not use more than 70%. In fact, it's closer to 69.7% natural logarithm of 2. You shouldn't use more than so much of that resource. But that is a different sort of uh, problem, and not this problem. So we said, what, are, what is that bound for this particular problem? So to what extent can I use my radar, my resource? Uh, because if I use it 70% of the time, and that's the maximum I can go before I'm not able to generate a schedule, then I should make sure that uh, I don't use it more than 70%. So we spent a lot of time, and then we did a lot of empirical analysis on our algorithms. We generated lots of task sets. We got synthetics of task sets from the, uh, from the Navy. And this is what we found. Okay? If I increase the utilization of the radar, roughly up to about 75%, I could always, my scheduling algorithm could always generate a schedule. Okay? It could somehow always find it, and it could find it pretty quickly. If it went beyond about 85%, the scheduling algorithm could not find the schedule, and it could very quickly say, sorry, I cannot find the schedule. In this sort of transition region, the scheduling algorithm would struggle to find the schedule, and sometimes find it, and sometimes not find it. But what was interesting was that this transition region is rather small, maybe 5 6%. So we said, OK, we're not going to run our radars at uh, capacity uh, more than about 72%. And this sort of tra phase transition behavior at that time, we did all these experiments, and we thought, oh, it's really good. Uh, we've not seen this before. Uh, in scheduling problems. And then we did um, some background uh, study and found these sort of problems crop up all the time in algorithmic questions. Okay? There is a certain way to define how hard a problem is, and, when you're, and then you can find thresholds such that if your problem, the hardness of your problem is slightly below that threshold, it's quite easy to solve. And if it's well beyond that threshold, it's very hard to solve it. It's impossible to solve it. There is no solution. And you can very quickly come, conclude that there's no solution. And so the sort of swiftness of transition was really interesting. And as it turns out, the parallel here is problem solving is very similar to 
what we observe in nature about how superconductivity works or how water freezes. So in superconductivity, you keep lowering the temperature of the metal and suddenly when you drop below a threshold, suddenly you have a superconductor. Similarly, if you have water, you keep lowering the temperature, it's liquid, and suddenly when you go past the threshold, it's ice. So these sort of phase transition behaviors uh, are quite interesting and occur in lots of algorithmic questions. And that's really uh, where I sort of became interested in saying we ought to understand more about physics um, and there's a strong correlation between what we observe statistically in the physical world and what we seem to be able to do computation. That um, whatever happens in the physical world is some form of computation and there is a very strong parallel to other computational problems which might have nothing to do with the physical world. Right? So uh, that's sort of the uh, introduction, right? That there's a lot of interesting things that one can learn from algorithms that apply to statistical physics and that we can learn from statistical physics that probably apply to lots of uh, algorithmic questions. So that said, I'm going to move on and say, you know, this um, understanding probably should pervade other aspects of how we build systems. <coughs> and in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, what are called psychophysical systems, which is sort of just a catchy name for uh, what used to be called embedded systems, but with a little bit more. Okay? It's a catchy name because in the US they wanted a catchy name and they wanted the government to pour in millions of dollars into research. Um, and so, you know, if you think of most of the systems today, uh, a BMW, um, and so on. It's a network of computers doing uh, lots of computation. And we would like to argue that you know, all of these problems of uh, kind of system engineering challenges today are really, in some sense, computing challenges. So, for example, we should be able to think of our uh, cyber physical systems, our, our computational computers embedded in cars, and say there should be somehow, uh, it should somehow be possible to reduce. Uh, Highway traffic deaths. So, for example, think about the amount of computation that's uh, going into cars. Um, Toyota is not here in 2010, but really the idea is you want to do lots of computation to guide physical activities. And to do this, somehow you have to learn from what, uh, what's happening in the physical world. So, that's the, that's the key uh, motive that you see. Yeah. Same thing for uh, biomedical devices. We are putting computing or computers in uh, physical settings and they have to respond to physical stimuli. And that's where things get really interesting. So a pacemaker, for example, is really running a somewhat sophisticated control loop. It's sampling the current heart rate and if it's too low or if it's too high, it's generating some signals to sort of increase that. So it's really a controller. And what gets interesting here is that this pacemaker has fairly sophisticated control algorithm, which could run into many hundred thousand lines of code. So as a control systems person, you might say, I can describe what the pacemaker should do through some control law. And you might say, okay, maybe I can do feedback control or sort of PID control of some sort. And that's fine, but it turns out it translates into many thousand, many hundred thousand lines of code. It's as complex, right? Your simple pacemaker is many hundred thousand lines of code. And here the question is, okay, if I implement a control system in software, how does that behave in the sense that a control system just abstractly responds in a somewhat natural way to changes in its input. Because the, you have a model of a physical plant and you get some input and there's some natural response. However, how does translating that same control law into software respond to changes in input? Okay, that's a big challenge because in the abstract modeling of a control system, you can say, yeah, this system is stable, uh, given all sorts of input. But once you've translated it into software, you sort of lose the same abstraction. There are more issues about how you just write the code to implement a control law that makes this problem interesting. So if the heartbeat increases by some small amount delta, your control law 
is going to suggest that the stimulus should also change by some amount that's roughly proportional to delta. But is a code, is a, is, is a software system that implements that control law going to behave in exactly the same way? That's the interesting question because uh, software systems are somewhat discrete. They have if statements and so on, which might cause the output to diverge significantly for small deviations in the input. So that's where we come to uh, hopefully towards the end or, or, or not. That's a big challenge. Uh, we're also putting sensors everywhere, and these sensors are eventually going to be coupled with, act uh, with actuators. If you have sensors out there, that's fine. You, you know, you're trying to sense and then maybe uh, trigger some response. And here, if you just have sensors, you have to actually send people to uh, respond to events. You want to say, okay, there's some problem, we need to take some action. However, if you combine this with actuation, then it becomes a control loop. And then you say, okay, what happens if my sensor inputs were incorrect? If you just had sensors, you might say, okay, you make the wrong inference, you send a team to do something, and they don't have to do anything. But if you couple it with very quick actuation, you might do the wrong thing. Uh, you might respond to some chain fluctuation or incorrect sensors uh, prematurely. <laughs> Same thing with uh, other kinds of sense actuate systems, robots, uh, uh, robots and so on, which are exactly the uh, same uh, sort of systems. So you have to say, okay, you know, think about the patient in, uh, in a hospital and <clears throat> You could think of a doctor making rounds using a PDA, there's a nurse's station monitoring the patient, all of this data being transmitted uh, wirelessly um, to the doctor as well. Uh, patient records sort of get updated at, at some administration, administra uh, administrator database. And there could be maybe a surgeon who's driving in in case there's an emergency, and the surgeon might want to plan his route according to how critical the situation is. Now, this is again an interesting sort of interaction between what's happening computationally and what people are doing physically. And what's really interesting is this is not science fiction. Right? There are prototypes of these sorts of systems that people are experimenting with, and we have no idea um, how exactly we will control for correct behavior. So, what's interesting here, right, is that, um, and why I think that you're a good audience for this sort of talk, is there's a lot of computing, okay? where you abstract the physical world. So the physical world really doesn't exist, does not need to exist when you define your computation. And then you have system theory, which deals with physical quantities, and everything really in the physical world is a control problem. You have certain inputs into your system, and they produce certain outputs. Now you have physical laws that govern how a certain input produces a certain output. Cyber-physical systems, therefore, are a mix of these computational systems and these physical systems. And we don't have a good way yet to reason about this composition. We think we have some parts of tools because control systems are part of this, but a control systems person is not really thinking about how the control law is implemented, for example, in software. They're not concerned about bugs in software. They assume that the implementation is bug-free, but we know empirically that in you know, a thousand lines of code, there are guaranteed to be about three bugs. So how are we going to build our systems that are robust to some amount of failures? The real world happens to be robust to some amount of failure. So how do we do this? So the idea is this sort of work in uh, emergency systems is interdisciplinary. It sort of fits very nicely with this loop of where we want to go as a society. Uh, what sort of technology we need and how we learn <coughs> science to build that sort of technology and all of this reinforce each other. <coughs> so the societal challenge really is what can we expect from uh, future systems because they're increasingly uh, cyber-physical, they're going to be ubiquitous and therefore we're going to have lots of expectations about these systems. We want them to work all the time, um, and you want some quality of service, uh, you want sort of timely response, and for certain cases, clearly, you want 100% reliability, they should produce the right output. So, how do we reason about this? How can we build systems that you know, we're willing to trust for long amounts of, long periods of time? And uh, that's uh, quite important. So, if, 
good, you might have thought, you might all know about Google's autonomous driving project. And the question is, how soon can we sort of accept it? Are we able, how will we be able to prove that these systems are 100% reliable or very close to 100% reliable and so forth? The technical challenge is how do we build these systems? How do we define what's the interface between the physical, uh, the cyber system and sort of uh, physical system? And these boundaries keep shifting because earlier what used to be strictly uh, physical could be now uh, part of your cyber system. And uh, the cyber system relies heavily on what's happening in the physical world. So maybe you can rely on the fact that the physical world doesn't change dramatically very quickly. So there's, there's sort of uh, enormous interest in saying, do we have the right modeling tools to do this? Okay, so that's uh, my goal here is sort of to tell you, here's these nice, interesting research questions. Um, here's what the sort of field looks like. And so the fundamental sort of scientific questions are that the physical world has real numbers, and in computation, we mostly deal with, uh, with bits. What does that mean? What is this hybrid system? And how much do we know about these hybrid systems? How do we reason about these systems <coughs> under uncertainty? What happens if certain inputs are incorrect? How many errors can I tolerate? And we want to understand complex systems. And this is where it connects back to what I showed you earlier about radar systems in that there are tipping points for behavior of systems. That there are threshold laws that say the system will behave correctly when you are operating below a certain threshold. And they'll start behaving very badly when you go over that threshold, just by a small amount. So in a sense, this uh, randomness is quite crucial to dealing with all of these problems. Just stop and ask questions if you have, because it's not a lecture. Um, and even in a lecture, you should stop and ask questions. So what do we have today are uh, prime solutions. So if you have faults, you can tolerate some faults in some way, but uh, you don't really reason about the physical world. You're saying, computationally, I can deal with certain faults. I can replicate things and so on. Um, when we write code, we can verify some small properties. Is this code? Never, you know, not going to crash. There's not going to be a null point of being dereferenced, things like that. But that's really not enough. We want to look at the bigger problem. We want to reason about security, uh, privacy, and so on. And the problem just gets very, very hard. Because when you build a system, it's easy to say, here are the requirements, and check if the system satisfies those requirements. Uh, in fact, even that's a hard problem. Building a system and checking if it satisfies its requirements is pretty difficult. But it's still easier than saying, does the system have properties that I don't know about, but I ought to know about? For example, there's a problem called feature interaction, and this can manifest itself in very funny ways. Uh, in about 2002-2003, uh, Mercedes released a car, which was considered very secure, and uh, it quickly became the top selling car in about three months since it was released. It also, in three months after that, became the most stolen car in Germany and Austria. And so there was a big manhunt to sort of figure out uh, who the thieves were. And after about an additional four or five months, uh, the thieves were apprehended. And so along went the Mercedes engineers and uh, uh, to go ask these people, how did you actually manage to steal these cars because they were supposed to be pretty secure? And the answer was, well, this was the easiest car we've ever had to steal. All you have to do is go on the roof of the car and jump a few times and all the doors will open. <laughs> and what really happened was that when the cars roll off, if you're in a crash and the car rolls off, you want the doors to open. You don't want to be locked in and not be able to get out. So the doors are going to open. But what's happening here is that somebody is bouncing on top of the roof and simulating what might happen in a crash, and the door's open. Now, it's quite easy individually. The requirements are if, the, if it looks like the car is rolling, you want the doors to open. So you can verify that the car satisfies that property. You might, you might say, why didn't they add the constraint? Did they check if the car was running? Okay. Maybe. Now, what if the car was not running, but the bulldozer knocked it down? So the car is still not running, but it's rolling down the hill. How do you check those sort of properties? 
So it becomes harder to say, I build a system that matches my requirements, and then, now that I've built the system, are there new properties that I never even thought about that exist in the system? Because those properties become likely to you know, lead to failures or unexpected consequences. And that's extremely difficult to say, how do I automatically find properties of the system? Right? In physics, that's exactly what we do. We try to find properties about the real world. And it takes us lots of experimentation to actually go figure out what these properties are. And when we build these systems, we now suddenly similarly have to go discover these hidden properties. They may not part of our requirements, but they might open up potential problems. So what I'm now going to do is um, we could do a couple of things. We can stop here and say, you know, this is the landscape of what are the problems. Or I can just talk a little bit about some work that uh, has been happening in terms of what we can do to prove that certain programs are robust. So what would you like me to do? You want me to talk about this, or do you just want to have questions? Sort of, I've given you the outline, right? There's uh, this enormous sort of challenge of reasoning about systems, especially when you write software. And the problem is this combination of software and controlling a physical plant have very, very interesting behavior patterns. Because you, you, know, you, uh, you have an if statement that switches say if x less than zero, and then you might say, okay, what if the input changed by a small amount? So I go from taking one path of the if statement to taking another path of the if statement. How much is that going to change my output? How significant is that? Right? Because if I'm doing sampling with sensors, then what if the sensor was wrong? If the sensor is wrong, how do I know what the ground truth is? How many sensors do I need to actually estimate that this is the correct value uh, that the sensor should be obtaining? Uh, so it leads to sort of really uh, interesting questions that we need to answer about, uh, before we can completely trust these systems. Uh, trusting computing systems is a big deal. Okay? Uh, in this context, you know, computing systems can do bizarre things. What exactly are you going to trust? Are you going to write a C or C++ or Java program and just verify your Java program? Is it enough to verify the source code or do you actually have to verify the binary that gets produced and is actually executed? Uh, so Ken, Ken Thompson, who was one of the inventors of C, when he won the ACM Tuning Award for inventing C, uh, gave this really interesting talk which was titled Reflections on Trusting Trust. And he said, you should never verify that your source code is good enough because you have to go verify that your compiler is correct. Because it's possible for the compiler to do very mysterious things to code. The compiler can take a piece of code and deliberately insert, uh, if, if the compiler, for example, knows that it's compiling an operating system, then it can insert trap doors that open ways for security attacks. And now you have to say, okay, how do I know that the compiler has this uh, capability? You might not, you have to now trust, you have to test the compiler. And then you have to say, I have to, is it, do I look at the source of the compiler? Because now this could happen in mysterious ways. The compiler could do this only when it's compiled. The compiler might insert a trapdoor only when it's compiling itself, when it's going to generate a compiler. Okay, and if it knows it's generating an operating system, it can do funny things, but not otherwise. And so, uh, these sort of issues of how do I trust what software systems can do uh, is quite difficult. So let me, uh, since there wasn't any time for stopping what's going on, have these these slides. So let me just go on um, and talk about some ideas about how you can say a program might be robust. So here we're talking robustness because data in general is uncertain. Okay? Uh, it's very easy to say I have perfect data, but usually there's some error. So you have some level of uncertainty embedded in the data. And so the question is how does a program behave with this uncertainty? So the idea is that reasoning about programs when their inputs are not uncertain does not imply that the same programs will be correct when you have uncertainty. That is a kind of challenge. How do we measure robustness? Right? For example, if you're going to produce 
pi, then how many uh, decimal places precision do you need to say the answer is robust, right? 3.14159 seems robust. What if the answer was 3.14160? Is that robust? Uh, is that good enough? If you were to render uh, an image, then is this a somewhat robust um, rendering of another image? If you had a binary tree, you might say, okay, what if the data changed somehow, and so I ended up, instead of getting this tree, I ended up with this tree. Do I consider that program still robust to input error? So we're going to look at uh, some systems that, uh, software systems that mostly deal with physical systems. Okay. Here, the question is, physical systems, you know, you usually model them as a differential equation, for example, right? And that's really nice. Modeling a system like a differential equation means you can use lots of powerful ideas from calculus to reason about its behavior. But, is the software implementation of a system that implements a differential equation also a differential equation? Can we reason about it in exactly those terms? So, for example, let's say you have a program P, and if the input is x, it's going to produce an output px. If the input is x prime, it might produce an output px prime. And maybe we would like to at least say, can I provide guarantees such that if the difference between x and x prime is bounded, it's less than some number delta, or not even some number, some amount, it could be a scalar, it could be a vector, then is the output going to be bounded by some other uh, deviation factor epsilon? Okay. So, how do we reason about these sort of systems? And to some extent, we can make some assumptions uh, about analytical continuity uh, and so on. But I'll quickly just run through some uh, high-level ideas and what what this implies. We might sometimes be interested in k robustness. For example, if the output changes by an amount delta, we could we'd like to say with high confidence that uh, sorry, if the input changes by delta, the output is not going to change by more than k times delta. That's sort of a nice result. It says, if there's a small amount of error, the error doesn't become significantly large. Okay, That's an interesting metric. And can we define, so here's the question, can we define these sort of metrics for every sort of program that we want, right? Ultimately, uh, it might get easier for systems that are implementing, for example, control laws. But what about arbitrary programs? What about sorting? If we said the sum number that I'm in my array to sort changes by some amount delta, what's the output array going to look like? Is the error in my output array going to be bounded in some way? So for example, here's a problem of looking at array distances. Right, so you have uh, two, you know, 4, 2, 5, 1, 6, and then there's another array that's uh, 5, 1, 5, 4, 5. And so we might say, okay, what is the difference between these two arrays? And maybe here we say, let's take the difference per element, and then we take the maximum. So that's the maximum error. So I should have got the array on the top. I ended up with the array on the bottom, uh, the, sec array, the second array. And so the error is the maximum of the per element error, which in this case happens to be 3. So we might say, okay, maybe this is one way of defining it. Okay, so let's uh, keep this sort of idea in the back of your head. <coughs> what about graphs? Right. So you might say, okay, here's distances on graphs. And so there's an input array that tells you what the distances are of different edges in a graph. And these edge lengths might be measured incorrectly because they are physical measurements of distances, for example. Okay. And we have errors, and so you might say, okay, what's the maximum error in my estimate? Maybe here we get an answer of two. So we can sort of work a little bit hard and try to define robustness metrics. And I'm going to sort of show you that uh, some idea about how we can prove that shortest path algorithms, fairly simple. Right? I'm not going into complex control algorithms, but to say you know, algorithms like shortest path, we could probably show that they're robust to some extent. So you might say, here's the problem, here's a graph. You want to find the shortest path between uh, Burbank, for example, over here, and <coughs> uh, the place up north. <coughs> so this is um, Silicon Valley, and, uh, and so South Bay, you might say, okay, so 
I want to find the shortest path. And you could run a standard algorithm, stuff like type shows algorithm, uh, on this graph. And all I'm showing you know is sort of development of type shows algorithm where you start the search and you keep uh, growing the path until you find the shortest path uh, <coughs> between this uh, vertex over here, your starting point and your end point. So it's type shows algorithm. Um, and this is just the progressions of Dijkstra's algorithm until you reach the uh, vertex that you're interested in and you just get an answer of mine. Okay. So that's the actual short spot. Then you say, okay, what if, sorry, the animation didn't work out really well. What if there's a perturbation? What if my starting point was measured slightly incorrectly? Okay. My distances are off by a little bit. Then, how much does my uh, how much does the shortest distance vary by? And it turns out you can use these sort of metrics of edge distances and so on. And we can say, okay, the shortest path now maybe changes by some amount of 0.5. Uh, this distance has changed by some small amount. And so the uh, shortest distance has also changed by some bounded amount. What's interesting here is that we can show that an algorithm like Dijkstra's algorithm is n robust if you have n vertices that form your graph. Um, let's say it's not good enough because I might have hundreds of cities on my graph. 100 robust? That is, for a small error delta, I'm getting 100 times magnification in my output error. Is that good? And so these sort of questions are interesting, right? But the fact that we can show Dijkstra's algorithm is n robust is still something. It's some progress. We would like to tighten it. We'd like to say, maybe I don't care about Dijkstra's algorithm. Because if I care about robustness, maybe I shouldn't implement Dijkstra's algorithm. I should implement some other algorithm, which might not be as efficient, but is robust to errors. Okay. So what one can do is to say, you know, look at max of an array. And you have the elements in the array, the maximum element of the array. So you're trying to find the maximum element of the array and the input. And so if there's a perturbation in the element, we can show that uh, this problem is one robust, for example. Again, some errors, there were a few more examples over here. But the idea essentially is this, that for every problem of interest, with a little bit of work, we can quantify how robust it is to input errors. Yeah, perfect. Um, in that example, I'll show this one. Mm -hmm. We move our slice command, should the shortest path actually be a different number then? I mean, we should be expecting the same shortest path with a different slice point. We might get, yes, we, will, we might end up with a different path. The question is, what is the distance that you're going to traverse? So, for example, if I'm interested in the shortest path, I might not really care about what the actual path is, but what's the distance? So, we're interested in, for example, the distance that we cover more than the actual path. And so the robustness result says that if I perturb my inputs to Dijkstra's algorithm, the output distance will be perturbed by some amount. And the path might be completely different altogether. All we can guarantee is it's off by n, n times delta. Right? So the path might be different, exactly. But this, this is where it gets interesting. Right? There are all sorts of if statements. And hence, the problem is somewhat difficult initially to reason about. If I said I want to measure the difference in paths, then it's different. But you might say, why do I care about the difference in paths? I, it's shortest path. All I care about is, does it take me one hour, or is it now going to take me an hour and a half? Right? And so these sort of results are probably more useful than whether the paths are actually different. So that's my argument. Now, maybe in reality, you might care about other robustness metrics for the same problem. Like you might say, I actually care about whether you know the path doesn't deviate too much for other reasons, and then you could encode that in your algorithm. Just as another example uh, of sort of the sort of insight, uh, hopefully some of you have taken a course like ECT14 or something where you've done multi-threaded programming and you might have done some synchronization and uh, there are algorithms that tell you if you have to do synchronization and you want to avoid deadlocks and things like that, you have to use algorithms like Banker's algorithm and Peterson's algorithm in the operating system. Uh, just as a quick aside, you might say, okay, what is the better choice if there are errors? What if my CPU is faulty? Which is the better algorithm to use? Okay? 
So as it turns out, experimental studies, and we can even prove these results, show that uh, Peterson's algorithm, which is the preferred algorithm typically in these problems, if subject to input errors, is less robust than a more, ineff more inefficient algorithm. So this raises all sorts of issues. Uh, maybe we should give up time efficiency for robustness. That's an interesting direction. In fact, robustness might be the metric we care about because the systems we are building are going to be unreliable. They're going to be faulty. So maybe we should protect against faults rather than uh, against performance. So that's an interesting thing. So how can we sort of come up with these results? You can say, you know, for an input deviation of delta, you can characterize the output deviation. And so we can construct some kind of matrix which reflects the robustness in these systems. Uh, I'll just go over this quickly. It's not crucial. I just want to give you the intuition. So for example, uh, if x is 0, greater than 0, I can do y equals negative sine x plus 1. If x is um, less than 0, I can do y equals sine x. And so you get these two different curves. <coughs> and how do we sort of show that this sort of algorithm is robust? This sort of program that has this implementation is robust. <coughs> and so you can look at what these uh, error matrices might be by looking at these different parts. So let's say if there's a branch statement, and then you look at what's the robustness of this side of the branch to certain errors, what's the robustness of the other side of the branch to certain errors, and if I'm interested in overall robustness, then you can say the robustness of this entire uh, pro, you know, code segment is the maximum of the two errors, that is, uh, the robustness along one path versus the robustness along another path. Similarly, if you have serial code and you have certain functions that, you know, program one and then program two, then as it turns out, P1 has some robustness matrix R1, the output of P1 is fed to P2, and P2 has a robustness matrix R2, and so this is sort of like a chain rule. The entire program has robustness matrix that's the product of these two uh, robustness matrix. And then with a little bit sort of work, you said, oh, these are all continuous functions, uh, and so on. We can say, okay, let's assume that P is continuous. That is, for small changes in input, the output uh, is also changes by delta, right? There are no standard notions of continuity. Uh, and in fact, we have stronger notions of continuity. You could say I want Lebesgue style continuity. And so you can say, in these cases, for example, if I'm doing if my program is, um, has continuity sort of constraint and it's executed in a while loop, for example, then the error might grow as I do more executions. And in this case, after n iterations, for example, the robustness is R to the n. And so this quickly, uh, let me, I'll actually skip over this because this is just to show how we can show that Dijkstra's algorithm is very robust. Uh, and you can see, where does this all apply? Okay. You can show now with work that pro, you know, programs that implement control systems are robust to some extent. We can also use this to do other, uh, prove robustness results in other cases which are interesting. For example, what has been discovered sort of empirically is that when we do computation, when we do computation, we sometimes do too much computation. That is. If you're doing some matrix operation, it's not necessarily uh, it's not necessary that you do all iterations in your loop. It turns out if you skip a few loop iterations altogether, your output still doesn't change too much. Okay? So if you have a for loop, for example, and you say increment i by one for each iteration, and you say, okay, what happens if I change that? Let me increment i by two. How much does my output change? It turns out not a whole lot. Why is this useful? If I had 100,000 iterations and I reduce it to 50,000 iterations, it reduces the energy for that computation by a factor of two. I don't need to do so much work. So in this world of building cyber-physical systems, the sort of additional dimension that comes in is, oh, these computational devices consume energy, so I want to minimize energy. Physical systems are surprisingly robust to errors in computation. And so we would like to say, maybe I can skip loops skip certain iterations of loops. And this was actually sort of a work that began at MIT, uh, Martin Renard and his group, 
and uh, they said, you know, just skip every set, every even iteration of a loop, just skip it. And they said, for most programs, this makes absolutely no difference to the output. So image processing algorithms and so on, it's a very little difference. Uh, what one would like to do is, what they did not prove was that this sort of approximation is robust. They said, practically, yes, it doesn't make any difference in our empirical evaluation. Can we prove that this actually has a good robustness property? It turns out with some work along these lines, you can show that there is uh, these sort of approximations are robust. Why does this matter, right? So you're doing some image processing, and all you're doing is you're doing less work. What is the impact of less work? Maybe uh, some blurring. Okay? So you might get a somewhat clear view of a football, and now this looks somewhat blurry, it doesn't necessarily look like uh, a football. But if you did, if you skipped a few iterations of a loop that's doing some computation, you get some error, but that error might not be so significant. The idea here is all of this notion of robustness can be applied when you want to approximate an algorithm, basically trade off accuracy of the solution for reduced cost. So this is uh, not in the same sense of proving that a system is robust as I began with, but it turns out there are side effects to all of these, these ideas. Okay. So sorting the first, for example, uh, so if I looked at this, I have uh, changed, so here's the original uh, array 42516, one of those entries is, uh, the two has become a seven, so we say, how much does that change the output? The original sorted array was 12456. <coughs> And in this case, you end up with 1, 4, 5, 6, 7. And here, the error is sort of a cumulative error. That is, the difference between here and here is 2. Here and here is 1. Um, here and here is 1. So here and here is 1. So the total sort of cumulative error is 5. And as it turns out, sorting, for example, we can show is 1 delta, 1 robust. That is, if one of your values changes by 5, the cumulative error in your output array is also 5, or bound to less than 5. Okay, so this is sort of interesting, because sorting is your classical sort of combinatorial algorithm. It doesn't relate to physical world as much. But you can show that if subject to some errors, you can still bound uh, the errors in your output to sorting error. Depends on how you define the error metric, right? So here I'm saying cumulative error across all elements. And you might say, okay, if these represent sort of uh, some signals that I've sampled, maybe that error is acceptable, right? So uh, it suggests that we can sort of understand these systems, right? So to sort of uh, finish up uh, this part, what is this leading to? It says this whole idea of looking at psychophysical systems requires a whole breadth of disciplines to come and work together, okay? So starting with, you know, all sorts of engineering uh, and uh, natural sciences, to work with people in uh, specific sectors to really say, what is the metric that you care about? What affects the robustness of your systems? And then can we prove that the software that applies to those systems is sufficiently robust? One of the products of implications is, you know, to pitch, you know, why is this research interesting? It's naturally interdisciplinary. Your, your notion of robustness comes from understanding a specific discipline. And so as a computer engineer, you sort of go in talk to other people and say, you know, what's the notion of robustness in a biomedical system? What as a doctor would you care about? How much confidence do you have for errors? And so this collaborative nature sort of makes it quite interesting. And in terms of what you learn, it sort of brings together the speed and continuous mathematics, which sort of there's this schism in how they are taught, uh, unfortunately, and that needs to go away. And it sort of brings together uh, software hardware design with systems engineering which is really what everything is all about. Any sort of engineering is about building a system and saying, if I give it certain input, how do I produce a specific output? Or, here's an input, this is the desired output, how do I build a system that matches that? Everything that we do in the world as engineering is to build systems either to say, if I give it some input and I want a certain output, what should the system look like? Or, here's the system and I subject it to some input, what is the output going to be? So, we sort of really need to uh, think about these problems and connect. Uh, what's really nice is it brings together mathematical modeling and makes this uh, much more, uh, much more formal. Okay. So, uh, just to
for on time, 6.3. So that's uh, the quick overview. I, I know that I probably went through certain things quickly, but it's just to say there's a whole bunch of interesting problems. This robustness idea is just one of them. There are other problems. Proving correctness of a control system. How do you know that a hybrid control system will never reach certain states where the system is unstable? How can you control it so that you never reach these unstable states, especially when you're thinking of this in the context of a software system? So, for example, uh, the Boeing 747 runs a sort of hybrid controller. Uh, there's one high performance controller which is very fuel efficient. Okay? However, in turbulence, it's very unstable. And there's a low performance controller that is um, not fuel efficient, but it's guarantee stability. And so one of the breakthroughs over there was to say, to define a stability region or a stability envelope and develop switching laws for when you switch from the high performance controller to the low performance controller so that you can guarantee stability. Because stability at some level matters probably more than fuel efficiency if you're up in the air. And those are sort of spot solutions to these problems. And so we might say, are there more systematic ways to develop these sort of switching rules? When you add constraints of energy and so on in the mix of safety, right? Uh, that's a big challenge. Uh, and that's what makes this particularly hard. It's a true engineering challenge to say, I want to minimize energy consumption subject to all these nice properties I want in my system. And that's uh, going to be pretty difficult for us to achieve. Because we want to go there, we want to cut down energy consumption, we want all these nice things, so what are the trade-offs that, that we are willing to make, right? Um, so I'll stop there, maybe you have questions and, uh, and so on. Yeah, so thanks for listening to me for another episode.